I'm going to open the hearing on House Bill 68 and um, just a couple of housekeeping things as we get started. We have um, multiple speakers on this on both sides. Um, so I would ask that um, people confine their testimony to about three minutes. It's only fair that we get everyone heard um, and that we have everybody's voices added to the debate so that we can make the best decision possible. So I'm going to ask people to limit it. Um, as we go on, there's um, a great deal of people testifying in support. If you hear the argument, um, that you wanted to make ahead of time, please just make your point or reiterate it so that we can make sure that everyone is, is gets hurt. We are hoping to, we're going to extend the hearing and go till noon. You will see senators go in and out as they've got other committee obligations or some other bills that they want to testify. That's not because we're not interested. We have sort of multiple obligations at the same time. And we will make sure that any information that you provide um, each senator will get. So if you have a handout, please give it to Kathy, who's the reporter for this session, and she will make sure that each of us gets a full copy of what you submitted so that we can all um, review it. And we will not be executing this bill today because we do want to review the material that's given to us. So with that, um, I would like to open the hearing. And um, do I have Representative Merrick? As a sponsor, this is the one you wanted to speak to, right? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, members of the Senate Health and Human Service Committee. For the record, I am Evelyn Merrick, and I represent uh, District, Coas District 2, which includes Stratford Stark, Roten, Northumberland, Lancaster, Jefferson, Randolph, Twin Mountain, Dalton, and Whitefield. <laughs> I hope I got it all. I always have trouble with that. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to address you, especially with, in light of the fact that it is here in the Health and Human Services Committee, because this bill, I believe, came to this committee because it is about health care. I I fervently hope that after you've heard the testimonies from today, <coughs> excuse me, that the result will be that those using marijuana appropriately will be called patients and not criminals. I also have hope to shed some light on this useful remedy that has been around for over 5,000 years as a medicinal plant. HB 648, <coughs> excuse me, is a very narrow, carefully crafted bill designed to provide much needed relief to some of our most vulnerable citizens, those who are seriously and terminally ill. These individuals desperately need an alternative to current illegal pharmaceuticals for some that have proven insufficient in helping to ease their suffering. And Madam Chair, before I go on, I timed my speech, and it is about 10 minutes, but it covers many points that might help shorten it. Um, so if you have written testimony, we will read it. If you could summarize it, that would be helpful. Okay, I'll try to do the best I can. Um, HB 648 is designed also to prote uh, for providing protection to approved patients from arrest and prosecution from jail for using this highly therapeutic but presently illegal um, substance uh, called marijuana. And it is very carefully crafted to provide a safe harbor for only those qualifying registered patients um, in need, their physicians, <coughs> and a caregiver who is authorized to assist them. Uh, it also allows for the recommendation of marijuana, the use of marijuana by their physician for medicinal purposes without fear of prosecution, possible incarceration, or for the physician's loss of their reputation and professional standing. Um, and it frees up our law enforcement officials to prosecute people who are actually engaging in criminal activity and it keeps the focus of those departments' funds and, and badly needed resources to fight those more significant problems plaguing our state and community. It does not criminalize, it does not decriminalize or legalize 
marijuana um, for anybody in the general public. It doesn't promote the use of marijuana for uh, recreational users uh, or provide them for any, any excuse or justification. And it doesn't give a message to our youth um, that it is okay to use marijuana for any purpose other than medicinal reasons, just as our uh, uh, present laws don't condone uh, the use of legal pharmaceuticals that um, are being used by patients um, for whom it is uh, prescribed. Um, it, uh, it is, the bill is designed to, uh, to offer this <coughs> therapeutic option, um, which is a, a plant substance, and it's derivative that research has proven provides very strong uh, value, therapeutic value, in treating, minimizing, or alleviating suffering for those with a variety of debilitating medical conditions or from the agonizing effects of the um, treatments for those conditions. Uh, and that includes common and uncommon conditions, and I will read this, such as multiple dystrophy, severe and chronic pain, chronic wasting disease, glaucoma, HIV, a variety of cancers, and painful spasms that accompany multiple sclerosis and spinal cord. It, uh, it relieves the debilitating side effects associated with the therapies that individuals have to suffer through during the treatment of their diseases, such as the chronic and horrific nausea and vomiting, the inability to eat, the loss of appetite, um, weight loss, and malnourishment. And these complications further impact the disease and make recovery protracted and at, and at times unachievable. If a patient can't eat, if they can't keep up with their caloric and nutri nutritional intake, they will die. It has been, marijuana has been shown to achieve better relief with fewer side effects for many patients than presently available legal pharmaceuticals, which have proved, been proven ineffective. And that is proven through the doctor-patient relationship and the time that they use the legal pharmaceuticals. Uh, the, um, it is also remarkably safe. And as the American Public Health Association noted, uh, in a position statement, um, marijuana has an extremely wide acute margin of safety for use under medical supervision and does not cause lethal reactions. And that can't be said about other drugs that doctors <coughs> prescribe, prescribe and use every day, even over-the-counter medications, including things like acetaminophen, uh, which is Tylenol, which we know has caused at least 500 deaths a year um, in overdose. Uh, many of you, okay. Um, and many of the frequently prescribed drugs are also misused, abused, and sold on the street because it's easy to get to them. You just walk into a, a medicine cabinet and open it up, and there are these, these drugs. So, so it is a, those are highly abused medications. And it is, um, it's just alarming how those medications are abused. Marijuana is not addictive and does not possess the lethal potential of the drugs such as codeine and Percocet, morphine, and other based drugs. Uh, doctors have testified that patients have been able to reduce or entirely eliminate their need for narcotic uh, pain relievers when using marijuana. And in fact, the FDA released statistics from a, a study um, back in 2005 regarding the number of deaths in a one-year period associated with 17 FDA drugs, and the total deaths reported was six, uh, 11,687. And that has been substantiated by the American Academy of Family Practice, the American Public Health Association, and the Institute of Medicine. And, um, you may have heard of Marinol. Uh, Marinol is medication in pill form that is derived from marijuana, but it is, it's not an adequate substitute because it only contains one component of the marijuana, which is THC. It lacks all the other chemicals that are present in the plant um, that uh, moderate the high and that offer the benefits. It, the problem with marinol is that it takes at least an hour or so to, to work, whereas marijuana starts working within, uh, within minutes and gets to its full potential within five to ten minutes. Another problem with marinol is nausea the patient can't, can't keep it down. So it doesn't, it, it can't work. Um, it has bad side effects and um, doesn't provide the effective relief that marijuana does. The inhaled aromatic uh, qualities, that, that's a process that you use, a safe process to be able to use the marijuana, um, that accesses all of the components in the plant, so it helps the patient. Uh, in the language of HB 48, 
Uh, there is a provision for legally procuring marijuana for medicinal purposes. A qualifying registered patient may legally give marijuana to another qualifying registered patient in the state an amount of marijuana within the purview of the law of the case. So in other words, they're only allowed to have a certain amount of legal uh, registered ID patient can give a small amount to another patient. And that is a legal um, process. It is not sold, it's not transferred as a gift. A registered qualified patient from another state that has approved and is, has now have now makes use of marijuana for medicinal purposes may give some to a patient in New Hampshire as well. Uh, that would might include Vermont or Maine, um, Rhode Island. Those are the states closest to us. So there is a legal way to uh, obtain obtain marijuana for medicinal purposes in a legal and safe manner. It also controls it because there is allowed cultivation in the patient's home, so they can control the quality of the marijuana, and I know that's important. Uh, very briefly, some of you may know that I'm a cancer patient. I have an incurable cancer called multiple myeloma. Um, it's a blood cancer, and I have experienced firsthand the frustrations, the fears, the, um, the limitations, the incapacitation, the inadequacies, the discomfort, the, the nausea and vomiting. Um, because I've been through a lot of chemotherapy and I've been through a bone marrow transplant. And I was very discouraged with any of the legal <coughs> pharmaceuticals. They didn't work for me. And for patients such as myself, patients who have no relief from the nausea and vomiting and the inability to eat the malnourishment, my story pales. I mean, it, it, it's, I, I went through that. It was a short-term event. It wasn't fun. But there are patients out there who go through this all the time. And these patients are not drug, ad drug addicts. They don't support the use of marijuana for recreational use. They don't want to decriminalize it. They're law-abiding citizens whose only wish is to find a few moments of relief from suffering, from their uh, inability to eat, in order to heal, or the clarity of mind to connect with their families during their dying days without fear of being labeled a criminal or even worse, and thrown into jail. Thank you. Can I open it up for questions now? Because we're pushing on time to cover the main points. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll just take maybe two more points, okay. or a few very brief points along with this. Um, part of the problem, is, one of the concerns is that our um, healthcare professionals um, have, you may have difficulty with this. There may be a problem with standard of care. They have long been entrusted with the amelioration of uh, pain and suffering, and there are safeguards in place. Um, physicians are going to recommend marijuana the same way that they would suggest or prescribe to a patient the, uh, something like codeine or some of the more recently prescribed drugs. It will be Control. They'll titrate the dosage. They'll keep an eye on and check on possible side effects. They monitor their patients. Um, so there is no issue really with um, what we would call a physician standard of care. They maintain their standard of care through everything. Uh, the states that have legalized marijuana um, have all proven this with their physicians, and um, and it works. Um, this is a bipartisan issue. There's, there's, um, there's no ideology to illness. Everybody gets sick. We all know people who have cancers and, and MS and horrible diseases. So I, I just want to make that clear that um, this is supported by 71% of the voters in New Hampshire support medicinal marijuana and 78% of the voters in this country support um, the same. Um, I, mean, I don't I probably have to repeat the fact um, you know that the federal government has changed their policy and are now going to um, not weigh those who are, and not prosecute those who are using marijuana for medicinal purposes, as long as they uh, follow the state laws by the letter of the law. Okay. Um, law enforcement issue. May I address this, Madam Chair? This is a very important issue. Um, and it, it, there have been a lot of questions regarding it. The law enforcement agents of New Hampshire are obliged to enforce the laws of the state and its municipalities. They are not obligated, nor do they have the responsibility to enforce federal laws which are consistent with state laws. 
That is the responsibility of federal agents. If the New Hampshire state law gives authority to the state to allow the legal use of marijuana for medicinal purposes, the New Hampshire law enforcement officials have no obligation to arrest those patients who use marijuana according to the letter of the law. Um, I, I guess it just seems to me, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up, that to not allow the use of marijuana under appropriate conditions with the safeguards in place, ensuring the, the safe use and abuse is cruel, it's inhumane. I think that if we have something that has been proven to work that can reduce the suffering of the people we serve and we don't use it, I think it's immoral. I think it's unconscionable. This committee can make laws uh, to reflect what's in the best interest of the people we serve, and I ask you to look beyond your preconceived notions of what marijuana was thought to be and see it as the potential for the potential that it offers, a valuable potential, which is a, you know, the medicinal benefits needed by most of our um, most suffering and vulnerable citizens. I, I also understand the need for you to focus on the budget, but that is important as well. Um, we need to focus on the people that, uh, that are suffering in the state. The budget won't provide immediate relief and healing to people who are suffering, and they matter to you. So with that, I will ask you to please support the passage of HB 648, and I appreciate your time and attention, and I understand, and I have a few minutes for questions, I'll do my best to, to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for trying to convince. Um, I, I do have a question on sort of the, um, the securing of, um, you're still dealing with the substance that is illegal, so um, I understand that people can grow their own plants, um, but can you explain to where did the plants come from, or where the seeds come from, Is it, how do you, make that piece of it legal. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I appreciate the question. I understand um, how difficult that particular part of the bill mm -hmm. is. In the bill, as I mentioned before, there is a way for patients to legally get a, a little bit of marijuana to get them started. In the bill, a patient is allowed two ounces, six plants, and six seeds to get them started at any given time. Anything beyond that, if they are found to have more, they are uh, just as liable as anybody else to be prosecuted under the letter of the law. So a patient, and remember we're talking about seriously ill and terminal ill patients who are not going out on the streets, they're not driving, and they cannot drive, um, uh, who are just going to use what they can. It doesn't take a lot of marijuana to help relieve symptoms. So at any given time, they're allowed to have this amount, which is um, a very small amount, actually. And the chances are they'll run out before. Um, they'll run out faster than not. But if the question, I guess, is where does the original amount come from? Where does that original seed, where does that original plant come from? Um, that is a dilemma. Uh, there are ways to get it legally, but I don't want to, I'm not going to condone illegal or illicit behavior. However, I think mo most of us, if not all of, all of us, know that marijuana is out there in, in abundance. Patients, there are a lot of patients that are already using it. They've already gotten it from their, their children's friends or a friend or a, a, a relative. And that is not legal, I agree. And the hope is that um, they will be able to find it through another patient so that they don't have to worry about their kids going out and securing some marijuana. The kids don't want to get in trouble. They don't want their kids uh, you know, to have any issues. And a lot of times, a patient will send a family member to a local law enforcement official and ask them where they can get it so that they can help their family member. Again, it's not legal. Thank you very much. Thank you. you call on the other bill sponsors um, and other representatives. Um, Representative Russell. Yes. Good 
morning. I am Representative Trinka Russell from, I represent Stratum, Exeter, and Northampton. I'd like to address one question um, from the very beginning before I even really start my testimony. Um, 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 the use of the marijuana, uh, as far as being able, one of the concerns I had um, about this bill is that I wanted to, it was so important to me that we recognize the medicinal um, qualities of marijuana. That, and in my, my part, when I did some research with Representative Merrick, what I saw is the biggest, where there was any problems, was in the dispensaries in other, the 13 other states that do have legal. And I did not, I, I, I find, I, it was so important that this passed that I recognized that that might be where the issue is blocked. And I wanted it to keep it between the patient and the caregiver and the physician that might recommend it. So um, that is why we, I, it was important to me that it stayed within that, that patient. They are able to get it from the other 13 states <coughs> patients that can go across uh, um, lines, state lines, and receive a plant, seeds, or anything like that in order to start growing their own. Um, I do want to just recommend uh, talk about also that um, there's an article here because uh, I also I had heard a, a lot about the, the concern about how much marijuana can you grow. You're only allowed to have two ounces at a time, and six plants, and how much that pr produces. Um, there was a study that was done. It was called the Statler study. Um, it started under President Nixon and ended under first President Bush where they, for, they had 35 patients, and they studied the use, medicinal use for marijuana. I, it's all in the booklets that you have gotten, um, received from, all, from uh, uh, Representative Merrick. And in that study, th there's th still three patients that survived. They, they killed the study because they felt like they did not want to be recognized that they were soft on drugs, so it died. But there's still three patients that received marijuana in practices from the federal government. And um, through the National Institute on Drug Abuse, since they sent three federal medicinal marijuana patients a canister of 300 pre-rolled marijuana cigarettes every month. Yet, um, I'll just get to the point. An ounce of marijuana would be about 38 marijuana cigarettes. Last session, I voted against the, the marijuana bill that was introduced, and I was very conflicted on it. I strongly believe in the benefits of marijuana for medicinal purposes, but do not want to have a bill that would open the door for its misuse. Um, that is why I was very interested in co-sponsoring a bill that enables marijuana's use in a very sensible and restricted yet compassionate venue, which serves its purpose of helping those chronically ill with its broad, broad spectrum of relief that is not found in any other medication. I believe it is tragic that we are preventing marijuana to be used for medicinal its medicinal qualities because of the criminal element that exists. Um, my experience in caring for people with chronic illness as a nurse in various specialty areas, including ICU, I continuously saw patients give in to their illness and die before their time because the fight that had taken its toll on them emotionally and physically, and they lost their spirit. The euphoria experienced by many of the existing painkillers that are prescribed clouds your mind and puts you in a stupor, sometimes unable to communicate with your family in a clear way. Marijuana gives you a sense of euphoria without the side effect, thereby giving you a quality of life for longer and it allows you to fight the illness much clearer and much more aware. Consider your last bout with the flu or, or uh, you know, a stomach bug and remember how you felt. There was nothing that could make you feel worse in the world, you thought. Now imagine that same feeling, but it's not going away in a few days. Now you are dying or fighting a long battle with chronic illness that are you, you are not only experiencing pain, but other side effects, which often affects a person's appetite, causing nausea, vomiting, anorexia, and cachexia. These symptoms in turn lead to fatigue, depression, and an intolerance to treatment. I have seen it many, many times, <coughs> and ultimately to poor survival. 
In my work research, I found many articles for and yes against the use of medicinal marijuana. But when it comes right down to it, the only thing that matters is the quality of life to the very end for every one of us. And I believe it is people should have access to, access to all treatments that have been found to be successful. Um, there are all the other legal narcotics that are used for pain, such as Oxycontin, are far more dangerous in their addictive qualities and their misuse in high street value. In all my research, I cannot find anyone that died from an overdose of marijuana. So I hope you do really consider this as a medicinal drug. Thank you. Thank you very much, Representative Russell. Any questions? Thank you. Um, Representative Cindy Resnick. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, I'm Representative Cindy Rosenwald from Hillsborough County District 22 in Nashua. And I appear before you today as chair of the Health, Human Services, and Elderly Affairs Committee in the House. Um, in the past, I have not supported medical marijuana. In fact, two years ago, when I was also chairman of the Health Committee, I worked very hard to make sure that the bill at the time did not pass the House. I opposed it two years ago because I thought it was uh, poor, overly broad legislation and had a lot of loopholes that would have allowed what I thought was pretty much anybody um, to use it for just about any reason at all. And I do not believe that unfettered access to any drug is good public policy. So the day after um, the bill failed, two years ago on the House floor, I sat down at my computer and I wrote a very long email to, to uh, Representatives Merrick and Russell because they had supported it on the floor. And in this email, I explained to them exactly point by point everything I thought was wrong with the current legislation. And I went back, I still have a copy of this email that I sent them two years ago. And House Bill 648, the bill before you today, basically addresses every single point and fixes everything that I thought was wrong with the previous bill. House Bill 648 does not have loopholes, it does not have the lack of accountability or controls or the broad access by pretty much anybody that led me to not only vote against it, but actively work to defeat it two years ago. So this year, it is a bill that I can support. But now, the opponents of this bill argue uh, that marijuana possession or use is still against a federal law, and I understand their point of view. But I also know that there is a provision in this bill for um, a non-criminalized uh, way to get it in New Hampshire, and that is by being given some, not sold some, but by being given some from another qualified patient. So if you are a qualified patient and you have access to six plants or two ounces, you could give a plant to another qualified patient, and then you would not be breaking New Hampshire law. And I think it's also important to remember that Attorney General Eric Holder has stated that there will not be federal prosecutions in states that have medical marijuana legislation. And we are surrounded here by a couple of states where that is the case. Uh, specifically, I think Vermont and Maine, Massachusetts had something different. But I am, therefore, confident that we're not misleading the public on the, the legal aspects of medical marijuana. And further, and, and probably more importantly, I know that there are people in New Hampshire who use marijuana because they are sick and they are suffering. And um, some of them are here today. Some of these same individuals came to the House hearing about a month ago, beginning of March, and it was a really terrible snowstorm that day. And as I sat kind of in a room like this, but it was set up opposite, I thought, it was hard for me to get here today, but I wasn't in a wheelchair. I wasn't using a walker, and I'm not suffering from cancer or a muscle-wasting illness, and I don't have the really dreadful side effects and symptoms that these individuals have. So 
what they're asking from us basically is to say, please don't treat us as criminals, treat us as patients. And um, I personally am willing to do that this year because I am convinced that this is a good bill. I think it's a very, very well drawn piece of legislation. It is as tight as one can make it. And I believe that the way it is developed, there will be only a handful of physicians in New Hampshire that will be willing even to make these recommendations because it essentially will require a physician to put his or her license on the line. It is uh, specified in, in the legislation exactly what the conditions are, exactly how much, exactly for how long the approval is given. And so it will not be uh, leading to doctor shopping that I think we would all worry about. So with that, Madam Chair and members of the committee, I urge you to pass House Bill 648. And the last thing I'll say is it came out of the House basically more than two to one vote. It was a very strong bipartisan vote in the House. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative. Any questions? Thanks, Senator Delmar. Um, Representative Rosemont, would you clarify that last statement? Your, uh, the, the bill is crafted so narrowly that only a handful of physicians will be comfortable in prescribing. Is that, is that what you said? Well, I, I, I didn't say prescribing because, as you know, it, it can't be prescribed, but let's say recommended. I believe that as I look at, um, it doesn't allow you to recommend it for a patient who has cancer, for example. It says that the patient has to be suffering from the effects of the illness, the symptoms of the illness, or the results of treatment or pain um, that's refractory for more than three months, and that the registry is good for a year unless the physician stipulates otherwise. So I, I think that it's, it's very narrow. I don't think every you know, doctor in New Hampshire, and it's only physicians, it's not nurse practitioners, for example, is a limited group for a limited number of reasons. And, um, other states have provisions to allow for public input to expand the list of conditions for which it would be appropriate. We do not have that in here because our feeling is if physicians believe that their patients could benefit you know, from other conditions, um, they would have to come back to the legislature and ask for an amendment to allow for any other medical conditions that are not specified in this legislation. Senator Kelly. Thank you, Representative. I just wanted to ask a question to clarify again um, a couple of your statements. Um, what I understand that you said is that the federal policy states that there would be no federal prosecution. Is that for the physician or is that for the patient? Uh, well, I know it's for the patient. I think there are other people who can better speak to the, to the federal aspect. But um, <coughs> this would, uh, the physician would not be at risk here in New Hampshire for this, and and whether Attorney General Holder's comment applies to physicians as well as patients, I'm not sure. I, but I, I'm sure there's somebody here who can speak on that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Representative Phillips. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. <clears throat> I'm Jim Croyd, and I'm a representative from Belmont and Guilford and Alton and Barnstead. And I'm here in support of the bill, and I just wanted to be very brief to give you two things. First of all, my own experience. Secondly, uh, something that probably will be given to you by Mr. Simon that I'd like to leave this with the committee. It's a, little tiny history and I think it's very illustrative and I will refer to it but I'd like him to present. Um, first of all my experience. I'm a pediatrician. I happen to have patients that are little but then I have patients family that are older and it just so happens that I was encountering two patients about five six years ago. It was more than that. Uh, who had cancer and were in extreme pain and losing weight because they couldn't eat, they had no hunger, they couldn't sleep. And I said to both of them, 
uh, at different times. Uh, I would suggest that you try marijuana. And they said, well, what are we, how are we going to get it? And I said, your kids get it for you. And I said, that's fine. And they do very well at getting it, by the way. However, what happened was that the kids had for years dealt very slightly with minor drugs. And the police were onto them and after them all the time. So I went to the police department, department and said, look, this is the situation. I'd like this woman to receive marijuana. Kids can get it for her. But would you please lay off this hostile act that you're taking all the time? Because she needs it. And they said, we will. And they did. So the kids later, they were back in the throes of the police. But during that period, they didn't. The police were quiet and honorable about this. And the patients <coughs> said to me, that was a miracle that you suggested. A miracle. They started eating, they started sleeping, and as expected, they died two weeks later or three weeks later, different people. But during that two or three week period, they changed completely. They were able to communicate, they were able to rest, they were able to eat, and they were hungry. Now, marijuana I looked into a lot after that because I had heard this might be a good way to use it, but I wasn't sure. Well, I have never, believe it or not, I have never <coughs> prescribed what I could do right now today with anybody here who needed it. I could prescribe narcotics, emerald, morphine, codeine, right now. But what I found out was that, first of all, I've never done it because I don't deal with adults usually, but this particular adult had tried some of these other narcotics that were legal and vomited, and the marijuana stopped vomiting too. So, okay, let's just say I've had good success with a very limited number of patients too, and they weren't my patients, they were my, my, my patient's family. And the family was grateful because this made a big change in the last two weeks of these two people's lives. Now, let's go to something else. This is a piece of a miniature history of marijuana, legal marijuana. And I think uh, Mr. Simon will do a much better job. But I want to quote an administrative law judge for the DEA, the Department of uh, whatever. And ruled that the scheduling standards established in this permit for the use of marijuana back in the 80s in its natural form is one of the safest therapeutically active substances known. It would be unreasonable, arbitrary, and capricious for the DEA to continue to stand between those sufferers and the benefits of the substance. Now, don't forget that they're, we're dealing with narcotics all the time. And people are dying from narcotics all the time. I think they're eight already from, from uh, uh, one of them this year. This is a non-addicting drug, non -addicting, which has never been fatal to anybody that is known in at least our records whatsoever. And it's safe, and I can't prescribe it. <coughs> All I can do is recommend it. And I haven't done it more than just those two times. I find that very difficult to accept. If I have a therapeutic agent that I can use, it's safe. Oh, by the way, why not carbonyl? Hey, great, doesn't work. This was an effort to take something, THC, tetrahydro, or something or other, out of the marijuana and use it as a drug. It's a pill. It doesn't work. As a matter of fact, it caused more problem vomiting. So let's just say, I'm going to put that aside. This is a non-addicting drug. It is not available. And that's the reason a couple of people voted against it, because it wasn't available. And that's true. It is very difficult. And you have to sort of say, wait a minute, how can we make it sort of legal, but not fully legal? Or fully illegal, for that matter. It is not a narcotic. It is not a narcotic. It is not a dangerous drug. Nobody's died from it. So how why do we have all this fuss about it? 
Well, I'll bring up just one ancillary point, and that is the fact that we now know that the marijuana uh, rules are going to be listened to by the feds, so they will not attack somebody in a state which has rules that are reasonable to change this whole situation. That's been commented on before, and it's true. And uh, February of this year, Eric Holder confirmed that under President Barack Obama, federal authorities will respect the state's right to legislate or legalize marijuana for medical purposes. Would make it, it would make it legal. That's all important. And the second most important, which I really am very favorably attached to, is a new federal approach to tobacco. And I know that has nothing to do with this. But they have said that the FDA is now going to be allowed to regulate tobacco and, in turn, regulate marijuana, which they will now do. They haven't done it before. Thank, Thank you. you. Questions? Thank, Thank you very much. I'm going to leave this with you. Thank you. Mr. We'll Simon get probably will. We'll get copies to the committee. Thank you. Dr. Jarvis. Dr. Jarvis. To appear before you. I'm sorry, can you introduce yourself for the record? Absolutely, absolutely. I apologize. My name is Bradley Jarnis. I'm a resident of Coke City, New Hampshire. And as I began, it is my honor to appear before you today to testify on this very important piece of legislation. My name is Bradley Jarnis, and I have served as a law enforcement officer in our state for over a decade. I represent no government agency or organized group. I'm just a guy who serves 40 plus hours a week in the policing profession who believes that medical decisions should remain between the doctor and their patient. I may be the only active duty New Hampshire officer here today speaking in staunch support of this bill, but believe me when I say I'm not the only one of my kind who feels this way. There are more of us than you may imagine. I know this as I've spoken with many of them. Although other law enforcement representatives are here opposing this bill, in the name of protecting terribly sick people by arresting, jailing, and prosecuting them, or an understanding of federalism which would shock our founding fathers, I want to be the one to bring the harsh reality of what it means to vote against this bill. Simply put, when someone breaks our state drug laws by possessing marijuana, no matter how much they claim it eases suffering of a terrible illness, I will arrest them and forward the case for prosecution. I want to educate everyone following this issue as to exactly what this entails. After declaring to the individual that they are under arrest, I will forcibly place their hands behind their back and lock them there by putting rather uncomfortable hand restraints on their wrists. If they are in a wheelchair, I will most likely use two sets of handcuffs so that their hands will be locked to the side of their chair as handcuffing them behind their back would be impractical for obvious reasons. After doing so, I will conduct an intrusive search of their body, which will include their private areas. If they are in a wheelchair, the entirety of the wheelchair will be searched. If the individual is a female and no female officer is available, I personally will conduct the search. This search is not only for weapons, but for further marijuana or contraband that the individual may be in possession of. As this search is incidental to a lawful arrest, Anything that I locate on this individual's person or wheelchair will most likely be admissible in court. After the thoroughly intrusive search, I will then forcibly place the individual who is now destined for a criminal conviction in the restrictive confines of a law enforcement vehicle. If they are wheelchair bound, I will have to handcuff them in the front of their body and have another officer help me lift them into the rear of the vehicle. Their wheelchair will then be secured in the trunk of my police cruiser for transport. On many occasions, I've had to use controlled violence to get an unwilling individual into the rear of a police cruiser. The potential for harm that could befall a sick or handicapped person who objects to being arrested 
and does not want to be placed in the rear of a law enforcement vehicle is great. <coughs> this vehicle has a cage similar to a protective barrier you may have in your vehicle to keep your family dog secure. I am sure while securely detained in the rear of a law enforcement vehicle, a person who has been using marijuana to ease pain and suffering is going to feel like a criminal. This, vehicle, this, this feeling is not unwarranted as possessing marijuana for any, reasonable, uh, any reason is a criminal offense in our state. The individual is then driven against their will to the police department where they are ordered to sit down on a concrete bench and are subsequently chained to a metal pipe to immobilize them. If the person is too weak to walk or handicapped, I suppose handcuffing them to this metal pipe would be a useless and cruel gesture. The individual is questioned thoroughly during booking, fingerprinted, photographed, and allowed to call for a ride. If that ride is going to take longer than 30 or 40 minutes to arrive, they will be locked in a jail cell, which consists of a concrete slab and a steel toilet and sink. Or they may be transported to the county jail facility where they are once again questioned, thoroughly searched, and secured in a jail cell. If the county corrections department is busy, the individual could have a cellmate who is a fugitive from justice, intoxicated, a domestic violence offender, or whomever else the county department of corrections decides to pair them with. If they are paired with a person arrested for a criminal offense, they would fit right in, as they too have been arrested for committing a crime. Usually it takes a few hours for the Department of Correction staff to process them. While they wait, they will sit in a jail cell. If they are confined to a wheelchair, the wheelchair will not be allowed in the jail cell with them. Should the arrestee have to use the bathroom, it would require having corrections officers lift the arrestee from the concrete bench, lower their pants, and place them on the toilet. Can I ask you to, to summarize it? Because we're running out of time. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Um, I'm sure this process sounds rather harsh to someone who has not had contact with the police here in New Hampshire, but the truth is, this is how we deal with criminals. A person with an illness in possession of marijuana will not be subject to special treatment by law enforcement, at least not by me. Because the New Hampshire legislature has thus far declared that these people who are frail and handicapped and even have doctor's discreet recommendations to use marijuana are criminals. It is a well-known open secret that many doctors, even in this state contrary to our laws, will indirectly, unofficially, and with full deniability suggest to their suffering patients um, with horrible medical, medical conditions that they try using marijuana to improve their lives. This is the reality of what happens in our state, and I know this as I've heard this directly from a family member. Why can't we let these terribly sick citizens who live amongst us, our friends, family, loved ones, neighbors, use the drug that both they and their doctor agree will offer relief from suffering? I hope and pray that none of you on this committee ever have to deal with a terrible sickness such as multiple sclerosis, AIDS, or cancer. And if you do, God forbid that I catch you using marijuana to ease your suffering. It will break my heart to do everything to you I have previously mentioned, but I will because that is what you have directed me to do. Sick people do not deserve to be treated this way. Please vote in favor of this bill. Don't make me or other officers continue to prosecute sick people who simply want relief from suffering. It's inhumane, it is wrong, and thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Please, um, any questions from the committee? Thanks very much. Um, next is Representative Horrigan. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. One of the committee members does have a question. Oh. Mr. Brady, I just, uh, Jarvis, I just have a very quick question. Yes, ma'am. And I don't know if you can answer this or not, of confidentiality, but have you ever arrested, had to arrest someone possessing marijuana that was using it as a patient? No, I have not. Thank you. I have arrested many people in wheelchairs, though, okay. and I've gone through this process. I'm just curious. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Horgan and the following Representative Horgan, I'm just going to give you some the next couple of people so that we can be ready. Um, Bert Cohen, um, Ross Conti, and then Matt Simon. Good morning, Representative. Welcome. Well, just for record, I'm Representative Timothy Horgan from uh, Stratford County District 7, which is Durham, Lee, and Madbury. Um, this is an issue I hadn't thought much about until I uh, ran for office, but I find my constituents feel more strongly about this and just about anything else aside from gender equity even more strongly than the, than the budget. So there's some very um, there's some very serious conditions as other uh, witnesses have testified more, much more eloquently than I can, which uh, where medical marijuana is the only effective treatment. And I think 
main reason the big pharmaceutical companies haven't been doing research on it is partially just because it's classified as a Schedule One narcotics, and, and uh, partially because it's a natural substance which is the public domain and therefore it can't be patented and probably is a deep-seated antipathy towards anything which can make you feel good. You know, some, uh, something like antidepressants or painkillers would just make you feel less miserable or one thing, but something like marijuana, obviously that's a lot more controversial and I certainly, uh, I certainly um, share that uh, uneasiness. Um, this isn't the day to talk about legalizing marijuana. This is a very, very limited bill which authorizes a very small group of very sick patients who without access to this treatment would uh, almost certainly die and they can only use it in very small quantities under very controlled conditions. Um, we, uh, I haven't heard anyone talk about a slippery slope yet, but I'm sure we're going to hear that phrase. Um, I know we heard it during the Florida debate on the House. Um, Yes, this might be the first step towards someday selling pot in the state liquor stores, but um, there are many steps between this step and that step, and we don't have to take all those steps if we don't want to. Um, and this slope, those steps are up a slope. It is not slippery at all. In fact, there's going to be a lot of friction to be overcome even while our state's caregivers build a very small legal marijuana market. Um, thanks to decades of prohibition and also, I guess, Frankly, thanks to the growth of a huge anti-pot industry, there's uh, there's just all, all sorts of institutions, law enforcement, treatment facilities, uh, drug testing facilities. So there are just a lot of uh, institutions that have sprung up which are fighting marijuana, and I, I'm certainly uh, I'm answering to sympathetic to their aims. I think certainly uh, it is. Uh, I do. <coughs> definitely do not favor legalizing the recreational use of marijuana at time. But I think there's very, very limited this very, very limited bill is just a common sense, uh, just a common, common sense measure. So I think the right thing to do is to uh, pass it as the House did by a two-thirds uh, bipartisan vote. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Cohen. Good morning, Madam Chairman. This is the. Uh, <coughs> Uh, Burt Cohen, Newcastle. I was state senator from 1990 to 2004. And this is the first time I've been to testify in anything since I left in 2004. I want to thank uh, the sponsor of the bill, Senator Gallus. Uh, I'll, I think I can keep it under three minutes. Thank you. Spring of 2007, I went in for a routine checkup being well over 50. And I was uh, very surprised. Got some blood tests, some more blood tests, more blood tests. I was diagnosed with hepatitis C, HCV, it's called. Uh, I was extremely shocked and didn't feel good about it. it. May have been, I'm not sure where it's from, possibly surgery in 1971. They said if I had acupuncture pre-1992, you could get it that way, and I did. And it was possible I could have put off treatment, except I had a liver biopsy, and there were stages one through six, six being you know, headed out fairly quickly. I was number four, so I had to do something. I had no choice. And I knew that my type, genotype one, the treatment is uh, interferon and ribavirin, and mm -hmm. it's very, very difficult. And for a lot of people who have the same genotype I did, and there's a lot of it out there, it's 48 weeks of treatment, <coughs> and the chances of, of it working are 40 to 50%. Oftentimes, people do two sets of 48-week treatment. Uh, and it basically attacks the whole body in search of the virus that, that is the HCV. The physical effects for me, as for everybody, major fatigue. If I were to walk up half a flight of stairs, I'd have to stop and rest for a while. I tried to go to uh, my daughter's indoor soccer game, and just doing that, just walking around, was exceedingly difficult. It was basically like having flu, hangover, for six months. Not real pleasant. I was, I, sleeping was very difficult. There's anxiety, major depression, fever, chills, muscle ache. My wife said I could do basically one thing a day. And people said I was, uh, my color varied between uh, pale and gray. Those were my two shades. The biggest problem for 
all the people in the HCV profession, the medical people, is keeping people on the treatment because the treatment is so difficult. 48 weeks, nearly a year. Do it twice. Almost two years of your life. People give up. I almost gave up. There was a possibility. I would, thank goodness I was on a, a, a clinical trial, which was 24 weeks, but there was a real good possibility. It seemed highly likely I'd have to do another 24. And quite frankly, I might have quit and just taken my chances because it was just the treatment is so, so difficult. And other people have it a lot worse than I did, for sure. Um, so there was real fear of another six months. I probably would stop and give it up. I was able to get relief using marijuana twice. And I was kind of scared to come out here and say that it is illegal. It was very difficult. I have two young girls at home, age 8 and 12, and it is illegal. And it was like really <coughs> frustrating that I could only get relief. And for me, it wasn't a sense of euphoria. It was just, hey, I feel relatively normal. Boy, this is nice, you know. And, and with that, it helps people stay on the treatment. And I know you all want to help people heal. Of course you do. You want to help people heal. It's a very, very difficult treatment. And this can really help people stay on the treatment. And, you know, all of us are, are, are here. There's people uh, with all different uh, medical conditions. Everybody has contributions they can make to the good of our society. Everybody does. And we need everybody to be able to contribute to the common good and to help. We should not be interfering. Really, the law should not be interfering with citizens trying to heal from serious illness. And Representative Russell asked me to she forgot. There's a lot of people without health care in this state, in this country. It's real expensive, and isn't it? It's a kind of a bad economy out there. People can get this stuff very, very tightly crafted through the law. It's free. You get it through somebody else who already has it, and it can help you, it can help you heal. So the other drugs, the more dangerous drugs, you know, that, that uh, Dr. Pilly had mentioned and others, is, you know, that are legal, they ain't cheap, you know, they're real expensive. And I, I don't, I, I had hip surgery and they prescribed, uh, I think it was Percocet. I hated that stuff, but it's useful. And we as, as patients have responsibility to keep control over those drugs. We have responsibility to keep control over those drugs. And very briefly, a, a, a former constituent, Nancy Grossman of Portsmouth, had cancer. She had Hodgkin's disease. She wasn't able to make it today. She lost over 30 pounds. This is from her testimony that I can pass this in. Um, as I say, she lost 30 pounds. Food became the last thing, for, furthest thing from her mind. Her doctor said, you got to eat. Uh, she made some cookies. Uh, I'm a normally law-abiding, tax-paying senior citizen. Breaking the law was for this in my mind at the time. But of course, I was. Um, let's see. I used it, and it worked. Trust me. It never occurred to me to continue using it after the job was done. I love life. I barely have time to do everything I want. Uh, and um, I recently had surgery and was sent home on morphine, ghastly stuff that I was told to stay on for two <coughs> weeks. After two, I had to get off. It made me so dopey. For the next five days, I went through hideous withdrawal. I heard a number of stories of people who became hooked on it even faster than I apparently had. And that was legal. In fact, the surgeon told me he could get sued for under-medicating a patient. Opiates are legal, but an appetite-inducing appetite cookie can't be. It just doesn't make sense. And that's from Nancy Grossman. She said she will come from the front. I hope that was under three minutes. Thank you. Questions? Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Russ Conti. stand here in opposition to the bill and to uh, voice the opinion or some of the opinions of the Department of Safety in that opposition. And I'd like to start off by saying this. I understand it's, it is a highly emotional uh, situation and you're going to hear arguments from both sides. Uh, I think 
Uh, our position is that we keep this in practical manners, and we keep in practical manners of how, in fact, how are we going to regulate something like this. Uh, we've all looked at it, we've all looked at the bill, uh, the issues of two ounces of marijuana and six plants, and um, the other issues that come along with it, who can possess it, who can distribute it, how do you get it. And if you look at it, practically speaking, all the speakers that have uh, talked already today, um, you can see the myriad of problems that would start uh, in trying to regulate, in trying to keep the two ounces uh, there, in trying to see who's growing the plants, how many plants do you have. Uh, you can only imagine um, a law enforcement officer anywhere in the state uh, making a motor vehicle stop or coming in contact with somebody that has possession of marijuana, and they have, in fact, been granted that through this bill. And uh, they have a, su a, a substance that the law enforcement officer recognizes as a controlled substance, but he or she does not know the quantity of that. What are they faced with? They're probably faced with seizing the marijuana in its totality, getting it weighed, getting it quantized at the, at the uh, lab, um, the cost of the lab, and probably the tremendous <coughs> increase in lab requests um, based on just that type of activity. Uh, the everyday interaction with people. And I think we have to realize that those costs are something in law enforcement that, um, that are real and that are something that the state is up against with the current budget uh, considerations. So we have to recognize that. Uh, however, it, this isn't a police and it's not, um, it's not a law enforcement and defendant-based argument. I don't see it that way. I think that the medical community should be the ones weighing in more so than the law enforcement community. And when I say that, this is what I mean. California, some of the states that have in fact legalized it, I'm sure there's been emotional arguments in both areas. Um, and they will tell you that they feel that they erred on the side of allowing it to become, you know, for lack of a better term, for slang terms, a cops and robbers argument. You know, the police are against it, we're for it, the police don't want to help sick people. You know, we do, it's, it's not true. We do want to serve and we do want to help those people, especially the weakest members of our society. So I'm here to tell you that it's really about that regulation. How is it going to be done? How will it be regulated? And as this bill stands now, it would be difficult, it would be very difficult, based on, you know, what we perceive as just simple issues, simple everyday issues. So that's what I wanted to speak to you on. And as far as uh, as far as arresting people and uh, arresting people in wheelchairs and and uh, all of the all of the descriptions that I heard earlier, um, I can tell you that I'm glad that gentleman is not the chief of police in the town that he works in. I can assure you that that is not what happens to people that are uh, that are in a bad medical way that have in fact violated any law, let alone let alone possession of marijuana. So I just would like to tell you that we'd like to keep it practical, we'd like to be realistic about it, and we would like to see, apart from the fact that it is, a, it is federal law, it is, it is illegal under federal law, and we are in fact, in contrary to some of the other testimony we've had, we have to you know, enforce both federal and state law. We, we're sworn to do that, everyone is, it's a law enforcement officer, so keeping it in a practical manner. That's really what I wanted to tell you today. I really don't want to make it an argument between who's helping who because nobody wants to serve the public more and the people uh, out there, the citizens that we serve, that need our help the most. We are committed and have been committed. Thank you. No questions? Senator Kelly. Thank you so much and thank you for your testimony. And I just want to say that, you know, I can understand that you're looking at the regulations and the practicality being pragmatic and how we do this. However, if there was the possibility of working with um, all entities to come up with practical solutions, um, which, and I'm thinking of, um, and I understand that federally and statewide that, it, that, that marijuana is illegal, but it is also illegal for people to uh, uh, drink alcohol under 21, and we have certificates that everyone carries with them to show whether they are 21 or not, and we have then a system of practicality to take care of that issue. And I was kind of thinking if there was some way to connect those two, would you um, be willing to work with folks to do that, or how do you? Well, we're willing to work with anyone, but I can tell you this, um, and I'm certainly not going to get into statistics of who's harmed by wood drug. 
uh, but I've also heard testimony that marijuana has never hurt anybody, and that's not true at all. I can tell you the people under the influence of marijuana get in car accidents and are involved in crimes all the time. And I can also tell you that marijuana is a problem in New Hampshire, as it is. And to think that you can say, uh, well, where, where should I get some marijuana? Well, get it from your kids. That's appalling to me. It's appalling to me that we should expect the youngest members of our society who we are mentoring to take over this country and this world that we're so proud of. So all I can tell you, are we willing to work? Absolutely. Is there a bigger problem? Yeah, you can apply the problem anywhere. It is a competing harm issue. You have alcohol and all the problems that come with it. Are we adding in something else? Let's take out the factor that we all want to help those people that are sick. We want to comfort them and extend their lives. Let's take that out. Let's look at this in a practical sense. So are we willing to work? Absolutely we're willing to work. We're willing to work to make any regulation, to make any law work for both the citizens and law enforcement. And we're not going to come in as the, back, the black cloud or the wet blanket over anything. But we have to be practical, we have to be realistic, and we have to recognize that controlled drugs that are out there, whether they are legal controlled drugs that are prescribed or illegal, affect members of society. They affect lives, they contribute to death. It's just a fact, and we have to recognize that. Thank you. Um, well, it's kind of covered. Thank you. Um, when you um, talk about your um, the practical approach to working when you have drug arrest, is there a is there common is there one drug that's more commonly um, abused than others? Well, I think there's a myriad of drugs abused in the state. Um, there is a lot of prescription drugs that are abused. Marijuana is regularly abused. Um, probably. The more, um, the more readily available drugs have really moved away sometimes uh, from marijuana to some of the prescribed uh, drugs, as you know, like Oxycontins and the Percocets and all those things. All, all I'm saying is legalization of anything doesn't end it. It doesn't end there. The regulation doesn't end. The enforcement doesn't end. The tragedies don't end. And I'm not saying that it, it isn't you know, done for uh, for a good purpose, to help somebody that really needs it. All of those drugs, all of those opiates, come from naturally occurring substances in this world. No question about it. Uh, I don't think there's been any legislation that we should start growing, you know, opium poppies so we can get morphine. And I'm not trying to relate it to that. All I'm saying is, it all started from naturally occurring substances. It came down to those issues now that we know is a scourge. We know that heroin use is, is up, and we know that heroin deaths per capita in New Hampshire are very high for the state that it is, amazingly so, even given the, the wonderful environment we have here. So we have to look at the regulation and, and its totality of everything. How, how does it add to the problem? How does it solve the other problem? And you know, the state police wants to be part of, obviously, what the solutions are, not what the problems are. We don't want to make this an, an emotional argument. We are not here, I'm not here to tell you that people that are sick and dying are criminals. I, I don't, I've never considered that, no one has, no law enforcement officer has, and they'll be treated certainly with the same respect, which is why I take reservation for the description of an arrest. But in the same, in the same respect, we have to recognize that this can be an ongoing flowing issue. Other states that have, uh, in fact, legalized it for medical purposes have a myriad of problems that they're dealing with and I talk to law enforcement from other states, it is not that easy. It's not quite that easy to talk to a couple of your friends that are policemen and say, what do you think? Well, I think it's a good idea. Well, how about talking to the people that actually have the responsibility of just regulating that? And you'll find that it's an arduous task, an arduous task. Thank you. Senator Donnelly. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, just one quick question. Going through the bill uh, on page five, Line five it says employers shall not discriminate against an individual in hiring, termination, or any term or condition of employment. And it goes on from there. Uh, commercial driver's licenses, they have to be tested periodically. And is that a federal regulation or a state regulation? It's a federal regulation. I mean, commercial trucking um, in within the state is controlled by the state police. That's Troop, Troop G is our commercial trucking troop. And many of the um, the standards for licensed drivers and commercial trucking are much higher. They have to have medical cards that not only dictate what drugs they can use and what they can be part of, 
what they can carry, um, are they measured medically fit to operate a vehicle over 10,000 pounds gross weight. So the, the regulations are higher and federal regulations. However, there is also state regulations that mirror many of the federal laws. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, John Tomasi. Good morning. I'll be brief. I come to you both as a law enforcement officer and as an economist. Uh, I retired from Salem, New Hampshire after 24 years. I'm sorry, can you give your name? I'm sorry, John Tomasi, T-O-M-M-A-S-I. I was law enforcement officer for 24 years in Salem, New Hampshire. Uh, 20 of those years as a patrol sergeant and two years uh, assigned to the New Hampshire Drug Task Force. Uh, since my retirement in 2003, I am still an active police officer with Hampton, New Hampshire on a part-time basis. Uh, I have, I'm also a uh, professor of economics at Bentley University. Um, very briefly, as a law enforcement officer, I look as, at marijuana as a benign substitute for more severe forms of pain management, specifically your opiate derivatives, um, Percocet, Oxycontin, Vicodin. These are all highly addictive substances, and it has been my experience as a police officer that if you are an opium addict or one of its derivatives, your life revolves around your next fix. That is not the case with marijuana. Um, as an economist, I look at costs and benefits. Uh, the benefit I see to uh, medicinal use of marijuana is a benign drug in the arsenal against pain. It is non-addictive. That then begets the question, what is the cost? A number of people would say that the cost, well, we have more liberal drug laws, uh, maybe that will lead to a greater use of marijuana. Uh, I would like to point out one study to you that was done by the World Health Organization in 2001 at the behest of the United Nations. And what they did was they looked at 10th grade use of marijuana in the United States and the Netherlands. Uh, these are two countries where the drug laws could not be further apart. Our laws in the United States are extremely draconian. Uh, we incarcerate over 1% of the population. Whereas in the Netherlands, uh, marijuana is legal and it is sold in uh, coffee houses across the country. Uh, in 10th grade use in the United States, they found that 42% of 10th graders have tried marijuana, whereas in the Netherlands it was only 28%. Uh, I've done extensive research in this particular area, and I feel very comfortable in saying that what determines drug use is not policy, but educations, norms, and mores. Thank you. Thank you very much. Question? Thank you. For that. Thank you. Uh, Clyde Terry? And as Clyde's coming up, there are a number of people who have come in and signed in late. Um, just as a reminder, we're asking people to, if you have written testimony, please submit it and we will read it. And um, if you can and just summarize it, and we're trying to um, stay to about a three-minute discussion. There is a limit. Um, the room time is there's another committee coming in, so but I want to make sure we try and hear everybody today if possible. Welcome, Mr. Perry. Thank you, Madam Chairman and members of the committee. Um, for the record, uh, my name is Clyde Terry. I'm the CEO of Granite State Independent Living. I'm here today to speak in that capacity as well as on, my, on behalf of myself. Um, first, as the CEO of Granite State Independent Living, we're a statewide uh, provider of services to persons with disabilities and an advocacy organization. And we serve a, a myriad of individuals with disabilities. And I'm here today for the people who could not be here today to simply say that there are those times when conventional medicines simply do not work to ease the pain and the symptoms of so many disabilities. And any tool that we could put in the toolbox to assist our individuals so that they could ease the pain, ease the suffering, so that they could be more productive individuals and citizens in our state would be a blessing, and I urge you on their behalf to consider passing this bill. I'd now like to just take a moment and tell you my story. Um, 
I have had glaucoma for 57 years, and I'm also a cancer survivor. Um, glaucoma, um, I was actually, if you go to some of the textbooks from Massachusetts Eye Infirmary, I'm actually some of the, one of the patients of the first child as they try to, uh, different surgical uh, procedures to try to control the increase in pressure inside the eye. I've had surgery since the age of 3, 13, 17, and around 1980, when I had gone out of my adolescence, um, the ravages of the pressure in the eye occurred again, and I've had about 27 cornea transplants, which is a consequence of the rising and falling of the pressure that could not be controlled in the eye. I have tried every medication known to man, experimental medications by the pharmaceutical industry. I have some of the best physicians in Boston that monitor my condition, and the condition continues to be out of control. And slowly, the shadows from the side of my eyes increase, and the tiny window of light gets smaller and smaller almost every single day. A couple of years ago, the ravages of glaucoma got to the point where my left eye just exploded in the middle of the night, and suddenly I only had a small amount of vision to begin with, but that was reduced by 50%. Today, I can barely look at you, can barely see a small light bulb over there. Um, and the idea is that maybe if this were to pass, maybe I would use this medication, maybe it would be the silver bullet. I don't know. But how can you as legislators deny that possibility? I urge you to consider it not only for myself, but for the folks that I represent from Grand State Independent Living. Thank you very much. Thank you, Clyde. Any questions? Thank you very much for coming. Um, Carl Hedberg has signed up in support of the bill, but not wishing to speak. Jennifer Vitendre? Not speaking. Not speaking, but in support of the bill. Yes, Thank sir. you for coming. Um, Karen Echo? Attorney General. I appear uh, and speak today on behalf of the Attorney General's office. I speak in opposition of the bill and thank you for the opportunity. Today, um, despite the fact that a dozen or so, the passage of a dozen or so um, medical state-based marijuana laws, uh, marijuana remains illegal under federal law. It remains illegal for doctors to prescribe it to their patients and it remains illegal for pharmacies to sell it. Um, that is the legal reality, and that is uh, the practical reality. Um, passing House Bill 648 um, will not change the reality. What it will do is uh, encourage uh, New Hampshire, some New Hampshire citizens to violate the federal law. Why would we want to pass a law that might encourage our citizens to break another law. The reason that's being advanced by the bill's uh, sponsors and supporters is a compassionate one. But House Bill 648 is not really what it appears to be to its supporters who so sincerely uh, support it, to the sponsors who so sincerely support it. This bill is really a stealth drug legalization initiative that has come before the New Hampshire legislature before many times. And the New Hampshire legislature has correctly decided to reject this type of legislation many times before. Today should be no different. Simply put, marijuana is not a medicine by any modern scientific standard. And if this bill is passed, it will, it will undo 90 years of progress in the field of modern pharmaceutical science. The FDA and drug scheduling evolved as a response to a time when medicine really consisted of uh, untested medicines and potions that were really available to any willing buyer. Many of these, these so-called medicines were 
either useless or often harmful to patients. Today, the evaluating the safety and effectiveness of drugs is a very specialized area that's conducted by FDA experts who, are, who have specialized training and experience in making that determination. The observations and opinions of laypersons and even medical practitioners who are not experts in evaluating drugs are not relevant to the determination of whether a drug meets FDA standards. And under the established processes of the FDA, anecdotal evidence is not considered a, a, a reasonable, um, acceptable way to judge whether a dangerous drug should be labeled and considered a medicine. So if anecdotal evidence is not science, and scientists do not rely on it as, uh, as acceptable proof, why should we? And if too many questions remain unknown for the experts to fairly and responsibly conclude that marijuana is appropriate for medical purposes, why should you? If this bill is passed into law, the state will be taking on the awesome responsibility of essentially vouching for a, a substance that is untested and unproven, and which may likely be proven unsafe. Who will ensure, I'm sorry, um, if, if this is passed into law, my next point I'd like to make is that it would result in an in increased, probably immeasurable cost at this point to the state of New Hampshire in terms of implementation and law enforcement, and it will open the door to a lot of problems that the state of New Hampshire does not need. Are we really prepared to construct a drug monitoring and regulating hierarchy to supervise the use of a single drug that we already know has a very high potential for abuse. Who will ensure that patients? Who, um, who will ensure that patients do not over medicate? Is there? There will be no substantial monitoring. Um, there is no um, any kind of adverse registry, uh, adverse reaction registry for patients. Um, what about the excess production? How will we keep that from being diverted to um, recreational marijuana users? And how will medical marijuana users initially obtain the drug when selling remains illegal under both state and federal law? How will law enforcement know when a person is driving under the influence of marijuana? These questions are really left completely unresolved by House Bill 648. What if the Department of Health and Human Services fails to accept or deny an application within 20 days of its submission? Under the law, the application would be deemed valid and granted, so long as it's facially valid, and the application itself becomes the person's registry card. Who will be responsible for verifying the information on these de facto cards? Who will be responsible for making sure that, the, that these cards make it onto the registry? <coughs> this provision of presumptive validity is really unprecedented in law and should give you, the legislators, legislators, some insight into the true motivation behind the bill. And finally, the amount of um, marijuana permitted by House Bill 648 is excessive and will inspire, at the very least, a medical pretext for marijuana cultivation. The six plants permitted by the bill can produce a minimum of up to six to, 30, six to 30 pounds of marijuana per year. What other medication is dispensed in such a huge quantity? Clearly, if this bill is passed into law, it will only fuel the growing, largely unreg unregulated, multi-million dollar criminal enterprise that's currently operating and sweeping our country under the guise of medical marijuana, and which is the result of state-based medical marijuana initiatives like House Bill 648. For these reasons, thank you. 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 Thank
what is the first step for a drug to actually get on the plate and go through that process? Well, the problem with marijuana right now, as everybody I think knows, is it's, it's, it's on the most restrictive schedule. Um, it's Schedule 1, which means that it's, it's illegal. Um, it's basically illegal for anyone to have it. Doctors um, can apply for a um, commission to um, study the drug, and they will accept applications. I think some applications have been granted to individuals or um, organizations to conduct you know, studies. So, so, I mean, the first step really would be to reschedule the drug to make it available for studies. And that is something that the, the DEA can do. That is something that the Attorney General can do. Um, there are many ways um, that that could occur. And do, you, do you know why that has not happened with this drug? Well, I, I think that policymakers in Washington have been unwilling to separate the um, the dangers associated with the recreational use of marijuana from any potential clinical benefits that the drug might have. And for that reason, it's, it's remained on Schedule 1. Thank you. Senator Goodman. Uh, just two quick things. Thank you, Madam Chair. You started by saying um, your real concern was that this would encourage some New Hampshire uh, citizens to violate federal law. Mm -hmm. Uh, is it currently federal law to uh, misdirect any prescribed opioid? Di you're talking about diverting, drug diversion? Or taking a um, uh, prescribed medication for its unintended use, or giving the prescribed medication to someone else? Well, it's certainly against state law to give your prescribed medication to someone else. I imagine it's, it's also a federal law as well, but it, it's certainly um, a state, it's against state law to, to share your drugs. Uh -huh. And prescription drugs. Prescription drugs. Uh, just a question on your yield per plant. Yeah. Um, your 30 pounds for six plants or one plant? It, it's it's, um, it's one, one pound, per, so for six plants it would be six to 30 pounds, it depends. Um, how the drug is grown, that you know whether or not it's indoors, whether how it's harvested, how um, you know how well the person knows how to be a gardener or how to grow the plant. So it can vary. In, in These yield amounts are um, different that we heard in testimony. Is there a, uh, an official uh, mm -hmm. grower's site? I, oh, I don't know. You might want to ask yes. someone else about that, but I don't know if there is an official site mm -hmm. for that. Those estimates um, uh, are, are, are wide, obviously. Six to 30 is a great. Uh, well, four ounces to 30 pounds is a lot. Thank you. Could you? Senator Brown. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thanks for your testimony. The, uh, the FDA standards for normal prescriptions, is that there to guarantee that? Each pill is the same, and each dose is the same. And, and if I might continue, has there been any, uh, I guess, studies to show that the THC content in each uh, bundle of marijuana or whatever would be the same? Oh, I, I, well, I think that the THC content varies, and I think one of the one of the problems with marijuana, studying marijuana, is that it, it does contain, I think, over 400 different chemicals that they've identified. And they, they appear in different con concentration from plant to plant, and that based on how it's grown, what type it is, et cetera. And, um, and that goes for the THC content as well. Um, I think THC is actually the substance that is, has been tested, that's been extracted from the marijuana plant and tested, and that's what, what we, why we have marinol, that is a synthetic form of THC. Um, but the marijuana plant itself, it's difficult to, um, I think, again, I'm not a scientist, but what, from what I've read, it's difficult to separate um, the, the substances such that you can measure them in a, any kind of a, in a meaningful way. Um, because even when you burn, when you burn the marijuana, it changes the substance, the, the, the combination and the uh, strength. So, it's not an easy drug to study. Is it? Okay. Further question, Madam Chair? 
Yes, sir. I was just curious, how much does the state currently get for, from the federal government for eradication of marijuana? And would that money be in jeopardy if this one passes? I, I'm really not in a position to answer that question. I don't know. I don't know what we receive from the federal government. I, I don't know what kind of attention this would um, this would cause. But, you know, I think we would be the 14th state. I have a question. There were several statements earlier that the um, federal government um, talked about not prosecuting um, arrest or not prosecuting in states where there were medical marijuana laws in the state, but law would take precedence. Uh, is your office aware of that? Do you have directives from the federal government to that effect? I am aware of, of the policy that Eric, Attorney General Eric <coughs> has, has announced. Um, as far as how that affects uh, this legislation in New Hampshire, whether or not we should do this or not, the problem with that is, is it would be subject to change without notice. So long as marijuana is still on Schedule 1 and it's illegal under federal law, um, it, the next administration may decide that they do want to prosecute states. It, it's an open question. And until the Supreme Court, United States Supreme Court, comes down on the issue of whether or not states, these state-based medical laws are constitutional, we don't really know if they are. There, it hasn't been answered, that question. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, Barbara, I'm not sure if the last name is after. She has a leave. Okay. Thank you, Ellen. Yeah. Uh, my name is Ellen McClung. I'm from Guilford, and um, since I was since I was 19 years old, there has been talk of multiple sclerosis, um, and. Um, I wasn't diagnosed until uh, 1995, so that's 20 years undiagnosed. Um, I want to talk about two incidences that uh, highlight what I feel are the truly beneficial parts of marijuana. Um, when I had had probable MS for um, 10 years, I was just getting ready to graduate from UNH, and um, I had an episode of whirling vertigo, which took away my graduation, took away my postgraduate internship in Japan, um, and I ended up thinking about killing myself. I've been through 10 years of this, maybe I have MS, and nobody knew anything about it in those days. Um, and a friend of mine came in and said, why don't you, why don't we just smoke a joint? So I smoked a joint. And it got me to lighten up. And I truly believe that that day, it saved my life. Um, then um, fast forward to post-diagnosis, it had become a very different disease because I was, sh lesions were showing in my spine and they were affecting my arms and my back and, um, I was having the, uh, having these spasm pains, and I was on interferon, the drug that was talked about before, uh, which the number one side effect of that was suicidal ideation. Um, and I was on that for 10 years. And I took a trip to Canada where they routinely um, give marijuana to uh, MS patients, and I was able to secure some. And um, the amount of energy that I had was just amazing. Um, my sister-in-law, who is a born-again Christian, um, let me smoke it in her basement. She and my brother were so impressed. Um, when I got back here to New Hampshire, being as they took me off the interferon, um, I, I didn't need the marijuana. Um, but to jumpstart my life again, um, I decided to run for the house. And that worked. Um, and uh, stress, I think everybody accepts that that makes illness worse. Um, so 
um, to me there's nothing more stressful than this, this scene that was described of being arrested, being prosecuted. I'm not a criminal. I'm not a criminal. Um, by nature. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Ellen. Yeah, I was a